Okay, here we go. So, I have all the books um, in real life, just in case these images up here aren't enough to uh, sort of uh, to, to prove the, uh, uh, the importance of these particular guests. I have in, in front of me the actual physical book. It's not just digital, you know? So, um, I'm gonna start by introducing M Matt Hamill. Uh, he's an animator, illustrator, and game designer, this fellow here. His student project, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, his student project, Gushundite, uh, was a game where you play a little green pig who uses snot to lure monsters into traps. And his current project, um, or actually, no, uh, not his current project, pardon me. Um, a few years back, he published a book uh, with Kids Can Press. Thank you. Um, about a delusional adventure. Um, so, let's see here. This is his current project, um, which is a little game called Lovers in a Dangerous Space Time, uh, and it was nominated for the Visual Arts Award at the IGF this year. So that was Matt. Next up, we have Ryan North, this fellow here. He's uh, the writer of the long-running Dinosaur Comics, uh, which uses the same six panels uh, to make a, a, a comic. And uh, he's done it pretty much every day for 10 years, which is insane. Yeah, I have to say it. It's pretty insane. Yeah, it's insane. Um, <laughs> he also wrote uh, this book here, uh, To Be or Not To Be, That Is The Adventure. Thank you. Uh, it's a choose-your-own-path book, not choose-your-own-adventure book. Quite different, very different. Very different. <laughs> for legal reasons. Um, and it's based on Hamlet, and it weighs in, as you might see, at 740 pages and millions of possible routes. He also writes for the Adventure Time comic book. There it is. Rachel Kahn. Yes. An artist and illustrator. Um, she's done work for many game makers in town and, and recently published a book uh, called By Crom, Conan the Barbarian is My Spirit Guide. And it pits artist, uh, urban artist concerns against barbarian values. Thank you. <laughs> this is what I've always needed in uh, some eye candy to show off the books. Eye candy, thank yeah. you. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there's another By Crom panel. Um, she's also working with uh, Steve Hine on Spirits and Sparks, a mobile locative RPG that pits the players against confused and mischievous spooks in their own town. And last but not least, Peter Watts, a Hugo award-winning science fiction novelist. That's right. With experience doing writing for the video game industry, he also wrote the novelization of the video game, Crisis 2, which should have been terrible like 99% of all novelizations of franchises, but somehow it was really, really good. Uh, so we're gonna ask him about that. And now while he's been dipping into the video game pool on and off for a decade now, none of his creations have actually survived to release. He has, however, acquired a small, diffuse fan base of disgruntled game designers who, last he heard, were off in some secret lair pre-developing an indie game based on one of his story cycles. So, these are our Panelists, can we have a round of applause? That's, come on, they're awesome. So, um, I just wanted to sort of uh, uh, maybe start with, with Peter. Uh, I, so, uh, A, what do you think is wrong with most uh, novelizations of franchises, and, and how did you manage to make it awesome in your case? Is this working? This is, okay, that works? Um, I am I'm not going to uh, weigh in on the quality of competing novelizations um, because I, I, though the, the, uh, some of the artistic challenges are, are pretty modest for, for these sorts of things, they pay really well. Um, and I don't want There's to burn answer. any of those bridges before I come to them. Um, <laughs> Uh, on the other hand, how uh, I mean, it, it is it is very kind of you to say that 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 uh, Crisis Legion was awesome. Um, 
in, in a lot of ways, it's easier than you might think. I mean, one of the, uh, the hallmarks of a first-person shooter is that the, the protagonist has no personality at all. I mean, they're essentially this empty vessel into which you are supposed to pour um, the player's personality. You're supposed to be able to identify with it. And that makes it really easy to, to add some depth to the character if, you, in fact, you want to become that character. You can make him somebody who hates his mother. You can make him somebody who loves cats or who has a certain sympathy for octopuses. Um, <laughs> So, in, in that sense, it's actually easier than you might think, because um, while, while you may blow up everything that moves on screen, you don't really have a view while you're playing the game into, into the head of what the person is thinking when they're doing that, and that can actually give you a whole sort of level of meta-analysis um, in the narrative. Um, but the thing I really kind of liked doing about it was, well, A, sneaking stuff past the guys who are actually the, the CEO of the game, which was easier than it seemed because they, they were Turkish or something and didn't speak English especially well. Um, so, so when you write a, an advertising brochure for, for um, this, this ultimate nano suit that, that involves um, um, a, a plug-in that allows you to metabolize battlefield carrion as a source of energy on the battlefield, uh, and you call it the Necro-Organic Metabolite Plug-in, or NOM, um, <laughs> they won't get it. Um, on the other hand, at one point, I referred to the character as a homoerotic Iron Man, and that one did not pass muster. Um, but the, one of the things that's really fun about, about making this kind of a, um, a novel is that these games are based on, in a lot of ways, really stupid premises. Like, you've got something that can, that can um, travel interstellar distances the way we cross the street. Um, and, and has a vast galaxy-spanning uh, population, and yet we can take it out with a couple of Chinook helicopters, and, and, um, and essentially it's the equivalent of a bunch of lemurs taking on, taking on um, the NSA with pointed sticks. Um, it just wouldn't happen. It'd be a Monty Python boot that comes down. So, so I had my character, this is something else that didn't quite make it into the final cut, looking around at what these aliens were doing and thinking, this is the worst invasion ever. Um, <laughs> And no, that had to go. But yeah. I was allowed to try and come up with some kind of a back-assed rationalization yeah. um, to justify something that you basically have to accept for game logic, for game play purposes, but which in a novel are just these huge, glaring, stupid errors. Yeah. And it was really, really fun. It was a kind of like having to rewrite the entire text of Darwin's uh, um, Origin of Species in Iambic Pentameter. I mean, what ends up... It's not a work of art by any means, but the fact that you can do it at all is something. You're proud of. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna move along and uh, just in sequential order uh, because that's how I like to read books personally. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I found your book very upsetting, <laughs> first of all. Um, and yeah, I guess I guess um, I, it, one of the differences with games and books that I've noticed is that um, with with um, with books, you always know how far along you are. You, you have like, oh, I'm, I'm like two-thirds, usually you would know, two-thirds of the way through the book, I'm almost finished, it's coming to its climax or whatever. Uh, and often in games, there isn't those same sort of markers. Um, but I'm, I, I, like, I mean, obviously, with something like, uh, like this, um, when I first sort of played it, uh, it was as an EPUB where you would, um, you just click to go to, uh, the, the right sort of next segment. There wasn't mm -hmm. a page flipping sort of thing. And as a result, I actually had no idea. I was like, I was sort of e exploring the very tip of the iceberg <laughs> of this particular uh, mammoth tome. So, um, like, like, there's so many branches to discover with this. Like, do you get, like, what kind of reactions do you get? Um, do you get people bragging about beating your book or anything like that? Is yeah, that, I mean, yeah. I think it's, it's worth bragging about. There was a guy <laughs> who sent me a photo. He'd marked every page he'd read. So at the end, he had this book that was just covered in, in marks. And he ha happened to read every page, including, like, he found the secret adventure and the secret endings and everything. So he, he beat the book. Right. But you look on places like Goodreads, people are like, yeah, I think I've... I think I'm done. <laughs> I read for a couple hours. I feel like I'm done. <laughs> but it, I mean, part of the thing, I, part, one of the reasons I want to make it so thick is that I had read these Choose Your Adventure books as a kid and found them really unsatisfying when they would be over too soon. Uh -huh. And I wanted to have a nice, long, satisfying adventure, along with shorter ones where you die really quick, because those are also fun. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, great. So, um, so your your book and audience, your book and game audience, isn't exclusively kids, Matt? 
but um, there's a lot of kids who dig your stuff. And, and what do you find like the differences between the feedback you've gotten from your book project and for, from your game project? Feedback. Um, I get like, the, the neat thing about doing them both is that I, I seem to have gotten feedback that's um, kind of related to the format that they're in. Like I'm thinking of the coolest uh, email I ever got about the book here was this uh, mother who was reading it with her kids and she wrote this giant story about her great uncle who was a soldier in India and I don't know, the, the character here he's like, he's like an old man with a crazy mustache and a safari hat and he, he's like in the jungle and her story was like about her great uncle's like adventures in the jungle and it was true and she sent a photo of this guy and he had the hat and he had like this white mustache and then uh, she told me his name and his name was the same name as the character. It was, it was Reginald and it was just the most bananas thing I've ever seen. <laughs> or, or it was really weird cosplay, I guess. <laughs> but, Preemptive um, cosplay. Yeah. But it was, it, was, it was like the coolest letter I'd ever gotten and it was like this big story. And then the coolest thing I ever got from the game was this, another parent who sent in like their, their kids work this time and it was like this book of levels that they made about the game like level like an expansion pack as a book of like levels and wow. it was just so so yeah like just getting that reflection back of the same medium sort of mm -hmm. pushback and that was kind of neat and do, did you find like that you got um, like is there a difference do you feel like our like my inclination would be to say that the that the games audience would be more interactive but maybe not the case based on what what you're saying here with the no I, I think I think it I think it it is um, just the fact that you're interact, you're touching the, the game and you're making things change with it, that might kick you to make stuff that is also more interactive. Like another cool one was like there was this class of, a, a classroom of kids in, and I think it was Madrid, and they did, they were doing some of the music from the game as like this class project of like playing the music, like learning it on their flutes and stuff. Oh wow. And it was, so that's just like the most craziest thing. Yeah. And then, and then I guess the, the, the book was printed in English and Danish, and so it was limited to that, to those markets, but then the game, um, it was just, it was much more, you, you never know where you'll get feedback from, and that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, cool. So, Rachel, um, there's a real sort of do-it-yourself sort of spirit with your, with your game work and your, and your book work, and could you maybe talk a bit about how the process uh, of creation is different in both those realms? If it is? I, I found so far for me that it is. Um, but I think part of that is that I, my main skill set is in the visuals as an illustrator. So for me, drawing the comic could be a very independent project. But when I work on games, it's really collaborative. I, like, even if I am making the game myself, I'm still soliciting a lot of help and suggestions and feedback and playtesting in, like, in my own little adventures. And then my, my bigger projects, I either work with a, a company or a game designer who's doing as much of the game as they're comfortable with, and I'm filling in those gaps and helping like flesh it out. So the collaborative element definitely sort of creates different experiences for me. Um, but I think like more fundamentally with, with the comic, it was all mine, but that also meant that like I could show all the process work and I could blog about it and I could tell jokes to people and, and feel it out because it was I entirely owned it as myself and I was free to do this. But even with the games that I own, showing the process work isn't nearly as satisfying. We're like, oh, well, I made some blocks move today. Here you can look at this GIF. I promise it's going to be really funny when I put in the mutating squirrel. <laughs> um, and additionally, I find with the comic, it was really easy to bring it down into tiny little pieces. So a comic a week till I had enough to make a book was a really achievable thing. But with games, Working for two hours on them each week feels really slow, and I think that's because the scope of a games project, even a tiny one, is so much larger <laughs> than the scope of a couple of comics, or I think there's 52 in the book, which seems like a lot, but it was a year of one comic a week. So I think that those are, are some of the major differences in that. And so the comic makes you feel like, oh, I can do anything, and it's awesome, and it's just going to take time and it's just me. And then the games projects are these awesome team adventures that often get really 
intense, long, like you'll do a good eight or 10 hour work session with someone else. So it is distinct, but they're both really fun. Mm, cool. All right, so um, Peter, is, guys, feel free to get in there, and comment, snipe at each other. Like make it, yeah, make it, make it ugly. You know what I mean? This is too. This is. Um, so Peter, is there something you want to do in a game that you that you can't do in a book? Um, yeah, I, I suppose um, making a lot of money <laughs> <laughs> probably easier to do in the game in the game area. I mean, that the amount of money that that I have been paid for game treatments that have never gone anywhere is obscene next to the amount of money that I make as a midlist science fiction writer. Um, or, or perhaps it's reasonable and I make a pathetic amount as a midlist science fiction writer. <laughs> um, so that's good. But, but I mean, more fundamentally, I think um, the future of fiction is probably interactive. Uh, I, and I think if we can stop focusing on, on um, polygon densities and, and shit blowing up and get a little back more into the story, um, which I guess is the whole point of this, this get together. Uh, that, that strikes me as, as something worth doing. The problem, of course, is always giving the, the user the illusion of freedom while at the same time coming up with a coherent narrative. Right. Um, and, and that is, I mean, it's a huge challenge. Um, and Ryan, since you want me to like snipe, yeah, thanks a lot it. for scooping me on the damn like you know. I mean, what we have here is a level of interactivity in a book which I am just about to say, oh, I can't do this with a conventional book. <laughs> so dinosaur dude here, notwithstanding, <laughs> um, but these it, are still things that I would rather do in in a game situation. Right, um, but they're, they're very different beasts. I mean, I was I spent a lot of time thinking about books versus games, and um, one of the interesting things is that you can draw the spectrum between pure narrative and pure interactivity. And you go back, let's say 30 years, you have books that are pure narrative, Wuthering Heights, you can make any choice in the entire book. It's like a baby book. It's told to you. And then you have something like Mario Brothers where the story is just, there's a princess go get her, there'll be no plot until you get the end. You have plot at the beginning in the little pamphlet and plot at the end of the book and that's, and the game rather, and that's it. So very little narrative. And then these two extremes, pure, pure interactivity and pure narrative. And then you have games like let's say Crisis 2, that now have this plot that can be, in fact, novelized and tell a whole narrative, while still having choice. So it's moving more towards, let's put story in games. And you have books like mine saying, let's put choice in stories. But you can't meet in the middle, because in a game, uh, state is really cheap. You can pick up a gun and fire that gun 40 minutes later, and Peter just remembers you have a gun. Well, in a book, if I give you, let's say, a knife, I have to remember you have the knife, and that means every choice after that has a knife version and a non-knife version, just for that knife to pay off at the end of the book. Right. So keeping track of that, whether you have this knife or not, becomes you double the length of the book effectively. I think you might be. I think you might be oversimplifying the ease with which a game handles. That, <laughs> there have been many, many times when I have gone into a game and there has been a door, and the door has been. It's like like the. Um, it's like the emergency exit at the Springfield nuclear plant. It's basically just painted on. Right. right. <laughs> and, and you have a super suit that can kick through walls, but for some reason you cannot open this damn door. Yeah, well, that's... that's... And there are many cases where it's like, oh, you know, in order to, to get to the next level, I have to screw this... Uh, I have to screw this, um, this Phillips head screw into the wood. Um, I don't have a screwdriver, but oh, here's this knife <laughs> that Ryan handed me two scenes back. I'll yeah. use that. But no. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. But I mean, that comes from a part of these video games being power fantasies. If you're playing as a person with, who can't move and interact with well, this terrible game. <laughs> Fucking world. Yeah. But what, what you're doing, like you talk about giving players the illusion of choice. I feel like that's kind of a pejorative way to put it because you're giving them choices. You're giving them a limited scope of choices. And you want them to feel like you can do anything in this game. It's GTA V. You can go yeah. and start a whole new life. And you can't. You can't even... No. There's a lot you can't do. You can't form right. meaningful relationships with people walking by on the street in that game, which I love to do in real life right. all the time. 
<laughs> but giving you, by pushing the player towards different choices, and they, they feel like, oh, you know, I could have chosen door A, B, C, and D, but I chose door E because it has flashing lights on it, you'll never find out that A, B, C, and D are painted on, yeah. unless you replay the game, which, you know, never replay a game, and you'll think it's the most wonderful thing in the world. Yeah, and the verisimilitude, if, if, if people are familiar with the appearance of reality, giving, like, basically when you're writing just normal prose, you don't, you don't give all the details in the world, you just give enough so that the reader buys into that world. And, and, it, and I think the interactivity is a similar thing, like you're, you want to give the player enough choices, you don't want to give the player every choice any more than you'd want to say, yes, I woke up this morning and uh, you know, stepped out of my, uh, stepped out, got out of bed and did, you know, went to the washroom, you know, like listing every single thing, even though it's realistic, um, and you know you you definitely don't want that kind of uh, level of detail. It's too onerous. I don't. I, um, there's an author, Jason Shika, who's amazing. And last I heard, he was working on a choose your adventure book where I think it's five, maybe it's four choices deep. But every choice has four choices, and each of those choices have four choices. Each of those choices have four choices. So it ends up being I can't do the math in my head, but a lot of choices. But they're all stemming from I get out of bed and do I have orange juice. Right. Have a glass of toast. Glass, glass of, of toast? toast. <laughs> That's the crazy <laughs> version. <laughs> That's what I want to do in a no. choose your own adventure. Has yeah. anybody ever uh, heard of a game called Portrait Sitter? How about Desert Bus? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Desert Bus probably very similar. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. As as sort of an aside or or sort of a coming at this from another angle, I think one of the things in the to be or not to be and in Right, like in a video game, in a first-person shooter, is that they're also framed as completely different kinds of narratives, right? So when you go into Crisis 2 and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm in a power suit, I can do anything, you're then going to pursue building this narrative for yourself about power suits. Um, but when you open up to be or not to be, you're really excited for this sort of Shakespearean like drama of ups and downs and who knows what's coming and mm -hmm. gory deaths. And who can I kill? But, yeah. but I think, like, so you haven't encountered the uh, power suit option. I have not yet, but like, it's the next book. It's all power suits. <laughs> Romeo and Juliet in power suits. <laughs> but I, I've been. I, I'm a big D and D nerd, and I've been reading about how to get the players on the table to to invest in writing a fun story together. And part of that is is literally telling them, like, here's the kind of story we're going to write together. And I think the cover of a book and the cover of a video game are doing that for their players. Oh. And we can frame video games differently as well to have them pursue more deep narratives. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good point. Um, but if, if this said to be or not to be, I would pick up this book. <laughs> I would too. I'd also pick it up with the current title, but saying Shakespeare presents power suits, that's, yeah. that's awesome. I mean, the question of, of how much interactivity when you're, when you're writing a game or writing a, a book, like if you need content written for every possible choice that, you know, the, the, the hours that need to go into making something like, like that has a certain finite number of choices and, and, you know, a game with a story has a certain finite number of choices if, if they've got dialogue and writing, talking back to you and stuff. But something like Minecraft, which is a game where you can just make anything out of blocks, so that has an infinite number of choices and you, you can really have total freedom to do whatever you want. But it doesn't talk to you because there's no characters because it doesn't do that. So what we need is a Minecraft made out of words that generates <laughs> random universes of, of text for you. But I mean, yeah. people, sorry. No, the problem with that is that you lose, again, it's, it's you, you lose, lose authorship. the, the narrative the coherence. I mean, the, the, there is, a, a, I think there's a value to telling a story. And that's the problem. I, I love Skyrim. Um, but um, <laughs> even though their characters seem to have kind of limited vocabularies, but, <laughs> but the thing about Skyrim is you have various modules that interconnect. They all have different characteristics that do certain things and interact with everything else in the universe. So you can do anything with, it, with anything. Um, and there are tales to be told there, but the Civil War basically goes on hold while you decide to go off and, and you know, farm wheat or make mead or something. <laughs> Yeah. And, and it's always just waiting, you know, the, the, yes, we will meet you by the haunted castle, and, and, and then you sort of go off and get married. <laughs> um, and then you kill your wife to ingratiate yourself with, with some god, and you find that you can't get remarried, 
and, and uh, you're playing it on a stupid PlayStation, so you can't go in and change the actual console. And, and when you show up, they're still waiting there, and they don't complain about the fact that you've been keeping them there for like three years. Um, so, so you lose, I mean, I love the idea of, I mean, that, you asked me earlier, that I think is, is what I would really aspire to do, come up with a modular thing like Minecraft, that would somehow at the same time allow you to tell a coherent story mm -hmm. without these incredible, I mean, sandboxes are great, but, but com, you know, with complete freedom goes a complete lack of responsibility. Right, right. And if I could somehow break that law of physics, hmm. I, I would retire. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things, when, whenever we talk about interactive story, I mean, I've, it's something as a, as a text adventure maker and novelist, I've, I've been thinking about a lot for many years, one of the things is, so, I, so this is really important what I'm going to say, basically. Uh, <laughs> uh, but basically, it's, it's um, uh, interactive, it, people talk about interactive narrative as if it's like chocolate and peanut butter. They, they're, they're great taste by themselves, but they taste great together, you know, it's fantastic. But truthfully, it's always on a teeter, it's always on sort of like a, a seesaw. The more interactivity you have, the less sort of directed author's story you have, the more authored story you have, the less sort of interactive choice you have. Now, you can strike a balance and you can choose where to be. Um, the, the one thing I find frustrating about the, uh, the, the, the kind of things that come in and out of vogue in the, in the games community is like, um, you know, when GTA came out, it's like, sandbox games, they're the best. There's like, they're, they're, like that's where games are headed. And then, you know, uh, years later, there's something that's like Last of Us, that's more narrative sort of driven and, and on rails. And people are like, that's where it's going. It's going that way. And it's like, it can go both ways. It's fine. It's, you can choose, as a, as a creator in those things, you can, you can choose where you want to kind of calibrate um, you know, your, that trade-off between interactivity and, 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 uh, and narrative. But it, it is a trade-off in some respects. I feel like, um, I mean, when you're when doing a game, you cheat as a creator with choice. You, mm. I, a good example is... Um, Walking Dead, the Telltale game, terrific game. They make you make these really important choices, but the effects of those choices, it feels like you're branching from timeline A to timeline B, and then if you look at how the game's structured, secretly, whatever happens, they'll both merge back into timeline C at the end. So it gives you this illusion of really important choice, mm -hmm. and I feel like the important part in a text adventure or a, a, a choosing adventure or anything is that your choices have, or at least feel like, feel like they have consequences, because... You can give the person a million choices of what to eat for breakfast, and they choose the orange juice, and you say, okay, you enjoyed the orange juice, and just move on. You're like, well, why, why did I choose orange yeah. juice? What was the point? <laughs> what, what impact did yeah. it have? Yeah, and then there's a flip side of that, where if you say you choose orange juice and you die because you're allergic, you're like, well, that was a stupid choice. Yes. Why would I do that? <laughs> but if you choose orange juice, and then, I don't know, you spilled in your shirt, and that affects the gameplay later on, mm -hmm. that becomes a meaningful choice. So I feel like maybe it's less important to talk about how many choices you have, and whether it's balanced versus the whether the choices you give the person have impact and importance on the story and the, and the narrative. Um, we're the gonna take questions? we're gonna take questions in about ten minutes. We're totally gonna do that. Um, so I, I wanted to sort of uh, uh, follow up with with what you're talking about here with like um, when you when you sort of be, between when you started writing the book and and finished it. Is there do you feel like you came away with something you learned about interaction design that could be applied to a game? Yes, <laughs> I do. Um, I mean, I learned a lot. I, I started talking about choice structure. I'm not sure if there's a better term for that, but the way choices are structured, I feel like, is really important. And in To Be or Not To Be, there's a part I'm really proud of where um, I managed to have information from one playthrough bleed into a second playthrough hmm. without having that visible on the page. Hmm. And that gives the reader the experience of I played this book and I've you know played it a couple times. Oh my God, there's a secret I haven't found out yet. Right now I can go back and unlock that secret because I know I've been given the key to to figure it out. Um, and it has to be a secret, otherwise you have an option that says you know do you have the key for the lock? If you do, turn to this page. First, like yeah, I probably have that at some <laughs> yeah, point. Yeah. Like it, you can't let the player cheat because they're always going to cheat. Right. <laughs> From my experience, I've yeah. never not cheated at a choosing event. <laughs> <laughs> if it was easy, if it's hard, I'll replay it legit. Right, right. Okay. So, Rachel, um, so Bicrom is, is really personal and revealing, but it's, it's really funny, um, and that pulls it back from being angsty at all. Like, it kind of, like, uh, it sort of, it's a great sort of balance between those two. Um, is that something you've tried to achieve um, in games, and do you think it's it's um, it's as easy in games as opposed to something uh, 
like that's more linear? I, it took me a, a minute to sort of think about that, but I think what I'm doing in it is I'm being really careful with my tone, and I'm leaving a lot of room for the reader, because there's, there's people who read my comic who are really excited about Conan and don't even notice that I'm a girl. Um, <laughs> and there's somewhere that's hard. That is an act of will. Um, so there's obviously room for people to get what they want out of it, um, and I've tried to consciously leave that because my problems are just a setting for Conan to say something barbaric, I guess. Um, <laughs> and that's really fun, and, and it makes the jokes, I think, a little bit more open. And in, my, in, in games, like the one that I'm working on, this locative RPG, we're trying as hard as we can to have as few words on screen telling you what your story is, because we don't know where you live, we don't know what your town is like. We don't know who your neighbors are. And all of those things are going to color your experience of like hunting these little spooks in your own town. Um, but we do want to set the tone and tell you that they're spooky. And so I'm sort of picking what to tell people and how much information to leave open. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that games are actually really good at with the mute protagonists and with um, like with dialogue trees and things, like leaving things for the player to sort of have their own experiences within these narratives. Um, and I think that, that that is actually really one of their strong suits. Cool, cool, okay. So Matt, one, I feel like um, a lot of, when I read a lot of children's author, I have a, a six-year-old, so I've been reading a lot of kids' books. And I feel like a lot of them are kind of writing down to kids or uh, they're writing to a market. They see a market and they're, they're writing to it. But I, I never get that feeling with your, with your work. Um, so I, I'm curious to know, who do you have in mind when you're writing? Um, myself, I guess. As a uh, kid or just as an adult with a kid mind? I don't think there's much difference. <laughs> OK. Um, I mean, like, the, the kids' book started as a, a zine that I did when I was in college. And it wasn't. It was for, I guess, people in my class, maybe, and, and my friends and stuff like that. So, I mean, it didn't have any nudity or guts or blood or anything in it. So, so I mean, that maybe made it something that could turn into a kid's book. But it wasn't, I wasn't writing it for kids or anything. Right. It just came out like that, apparently. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. OK. Well, um, unless you guys have anything uh, to say, follow up. We'll, we could start to open it up to questions here. Um, anybody? Yeah? Tim. Um, right, I should call you, I guess. Can you talk more about why you're so concerned about ending? Because you talked about there being two pathways, A, B, and then they end up in C, and I call that sort of cheating. Uh, um, and I, you know, I think like, like Mass Effect, where everyone is very angry about the ending. But what about the, like, the journey was different. Yeah. Let me let me repeat your question for the audio, for for you know the, the archives a hundred years from now that are want to want to know. The question was, um, uh, why are you guys so concerned about endings? And the journey having value. Yes. And it's true, but I also feel like people remember stories based off their endings. And if you have an amazing journey and a terrible ending, people say, oh, what? they won't say what an amazing story. They'll say, oh, that ending sucked. <laughs> I really wanted a better ending. Um, yeah, I feel like it's something with, especially a, a Choose Your Adventure style book where you have tons of endings. As a writer, I found that really easy. I was, I hadn't written, I've never written a novel. And this is my sort of first run at bat at that because in a novel, you've got one story and one ending. And if you don't nail the landing, you're ruined. <laughs> but in this book, there's a hundred, over a hundred endings. Yeah. And hopefully, you like in one of those hundred chances, someone's like, that was really good. That was yeah. a good story. <laughs> That's my ending. Yeah. 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 And as a writer, it made me confident because in a normal book, I'd hate to reach word, you know, 900, well, 90,000 and realize I've, this whole story sucks and I should have, I messed up at word 5,000. Mm. But in a Choose Your Adventure book, you're like, oh, well, that's just one of the endings. <laughs> you have stopped one. being a mammal. Yeah. You become a herring. I mean, <laughs> you, you basically, you lay a million eggs. Yes. And you and leave it to random chance to determine that like one or two of them are going to make it to the adulthood. strongest. Whereas yes. a true <laughs> mammal only has, the novelist only has the one offspring to raise and it's very expensive energetic. I mean, yes. I know as mammals, we feel like mammals are the best way, but maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> maybe the... Uh, Eggs are good. Yeah. Let's not let's not discount all of us who never finish games that we start. So, like, I'm never gonna make it to the end of Mass Effect, but I love that spaceship. 
Right. <laughs> cool. Why, why don't you finish them? I do not have the attention span or the skill set. Then you have to leave the spaceship behind. Yeah. Also, like, like that for me is the best part right now. <laughs> that is the solution to the problem. Rather than worry about an ending, make the journey itself so interminable that everybody quits before yeah. they actually achieve the ending. Yes. Problem the, solved. My experience is that people are very conservative when it comes to endings. I don't know if, Peter, you've had this the same thing. Is, is, is if you don't, as a novelist, finish with a, a fairly, you know, um, tied, all the ends sort of tied up with a bit of catharsis at the end, uh, your readers will complain. And, and to me, it has something to do with the fact that they've trusted you for this whole arc, that you're going to not screw it up at the end, uh, or that they're not uh, wasting their time. Uh, and I think that has to do with like, the non-interactivity of books in some respects, because they've put, they put that amount of trust in you, and they're irritated at the end uh, if they feel like there's, that a contract somehow has been broached. Um, breached? Breached. Um, Wordplay, man. <laughs> anyway, so is this is this just some passive aggressive way of telling me that you think my endings suck? <laughs> I I. Uh, <laughs> but no, you, know, you can just say that. <laughs> no, it isn't actually. But uh, but it, the nice thing with interactive fiction or media is that when the ending does suck, some of that can be put on the reader. Right. And <laughs> no, <that's, laughs> and the I'm, rest I'm can serious. be corrected Absolutely. with DLC. Yeah, no, DLC. you can correct the DLC, or you can be like, oh, you know, I played this book, or I played this game, and I didn't like the ending, and your friend can go, oh, didn't you do X, Y, and Z? That's the good ending. And you go, uh, oh, I, I made a mistake there. I'm an idiot. <laughs> when you didn't, you played a version of the game you didn't like, but you, make, you take on the blame there as a player, and that's really powerful as an author to shift that <laughs> outwards. I'm, I'm all about reassigning blame yes. in narrative structures. <laughs> all right, question over there. Okay, so the question is, um, uh, what is your editing process and how is it different when it's uh, a more linear uh, project versus an interactive proce project? Um, well, for me, I would, I cut out some paths that in retrospect were dumb. <laughs> that was the editing process. And I wanted, my goal is to have every path have something of value in it. Even the short ones, you want to have something happen that felt like I didn't waste my time reading this book. And so really it's just trying to make everything, it sounds really dumb, but trying to make everything cool so that there's no lame parts. <laughs> cool but yeah, that, that's, that is editing in 2013 for me. <laughs> else? Editing process, comments? I'm, I'm with Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool, cool out there. yeah. Okay. I, I find, I, find uh, um, I mean, I've never stopped editing. I'm still editing a book that I handed in to my publisher like a month ago. Um, and I'm finding, oh, rather than talking about it, they should just, you know, kill them or discover something in action. I mean, I'm, I'm constantly doing that. In terms of the interactive stuff, in my experience, uh, the editing is ongoing and you don't have any control of it at all because um, all of a sudden, the, some guy flies in from the Ukraine and decides that his girlfriend doesn't like the idea of a vast, intelligent yogurt. It has to be ricotta cheese instead. And so you have to change things almost on a day-to-day -day basis that already made sense narratively. Right. But, but that's some focus do... group somewhere says, I mean, the, the editing becomes more of a, a, a hive mind Borgian thing that reduces everything to pablum. Yes, but, but that, wow. that can be same, said the same, I think. Um, but the film industry, where you have, like, where, where it's such a giant machine, um, and that's also a linear sort of, it's more of a linear thing. I think it's, I think it's a case of, like, an industry kind of uh, uh, problem or concern uh, versus, like, you as a creator getting to decide how your book is going to go or how it's going to... Yeah. yeah, I think the problem is though making a, a, a big budget interactive game is not something it's not something you can do on an individual level. I mean, these little things, these more modest indie games, um, are awesome, and I'm, I'm starting to get into some of those in a way um, as well. But but certainly the big budget games, um, you're not going to have Tony Stark sitting down and building one of those things in his basement lab. Right. Yeah. Even even in like small scale games, it's still it's still like a balance between different like the 
the narrative and the art and what you can do with programming and how much time you have. Everything affects everything else. And it's, I mean, even in a little project, it's, it's all, everything's attacking you from different angles. And even if you don't have a focus group, you'll still play test and people may not get or be interested in something that you've put in there that you love. And that is an editing choice that you have to make as well. Right, right. Uh, do any of you have tips for what makes for like good in-game text? Um, of verbiage seems like a bad idea. So the question is, what um, do we have any tips for um, what makes uh, in in game text good i know in I know in the games that I do i 'm usually trying to scrape out as much as much text as possible like i'm a i 'm a visual storyteller just by nature, so try and keep everything like as lean as as possible um, as a gamer i I always turn on subtitles and you know, I, I don't like waiting for the voice actor to finish talking. I, I want to like get get as much as I can eat as fast as I can. Um, so I, that's something that I keep in mind. It works for me. Um, I think it completely depends on what kind of game you're making. Yeah, yeah. Like if you're making a JRPG, and I'm gonna have to talk to that shopkeeper 400 times, you give him one line. Like, please do not make me read his whole blurb about his family and the evil king like 25 times or set it so I don't have to once I've heard it once. But if you're making a, an interactive novel or something where you're really, you're really conveying most of the information through the words and the dialogue, then, then throw your weight into it and really build the whole world using those words. There's this game designer named uh, Dave Gilbert who had, I remember reading a blog post and he was talking about one of his early, he was critiquing his own early adventure game and it was like, this, he was critiquing this dialogue conversation between a couple characters on the phone. It was like, hello? Hello. Is this so-and-so? Yeah, this is, this is so-and-so. And I was going to ask you a question. Oh, yeah? What was your question? And then, it, like, <laughs> just, like, scraping that into two sentences. Like, and, and even though his game is all about story and talking and characters and stuff, but just trying to keep it as efficient and, and moving. As yeah, it, it's almost like, um, I mean, if that kind of talky, if it's a kind of talky movie and you're just asking the viewer simply to sit through that kind of interaction back and forth, it's, it's a little annoying, but when you actually have to interact to push it through, uh, I think people are, are more easily annoyed at like uh, excessive verbiage and needless kind of access. I think the best example of text I ever saw in a game in terms of restraint and in terms of a game that didn't even have any other characters that you could talk to except for an intelligent potato was uh, Portal 2, Take Your Daughter to Work Day, um, where every six-year-old 25 years ago made a battery out of a potato. Um, and you just walk around in the dark, and you look at all these hand-scrawled in purple crayon science fair projects. Veggie voltage, for sure, and potato batteries. And, and um, that game was such a masterpiece of ambient storytelling. Um, where everything kind of filled in just in terms of the background. That there, was, it, well, there wasn't even real interactivity. It was just you, you, you bore witness, and it was beautiful. All right. So um, based on what everybody's been saying, uh, in my own personal opinion, there's, there's an argument to be made that games are inherently nonverbal, uh, at least in terms of the interactivity that you can have with it, which is partially uh, technology limitation. Um, but if you look at a game like Fallout 3, where a lot of the storytelling is actually ambient in the environment, like was just mentioned, you go into a house and there's a skeleton in a bathtub and next to it there's a wine glass and a book. You know, it tells a million words without anything else. And what do you feel, uh, do you feel it's of value for an author to take his imagination and apply it to games more for world crafting in a starting state rather than telling a complete narrative. Because then, you know, you don't have players not getting to the ending, players get to make all their own story, and it still has everything that's in the author's head. Yeah, so, but... So, sorry, oh, sorry, let me repeat again. Um, I just like cutting you off as well. It's I great. appreciate that. Um, uh, the question was, uh, is, is an author's um, attention better spent on world building than maybe uh, traditional storytelling in a game context. Something like that. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, I was going to sort of disagree with um, storytelling games being nonverbal. And we we're talking about 
you know, skipping past the shopkeeper saying hi every time. But I feel like if there's a mystery that you're engaged in, then it becomes really interesting. Like, why? What's the shop you're doing about talking about? And um, suspicious. A, a game that's entirely verbal. I've, it's. Uh, I think my favorite game last year is called Analog: A Hate Story, and it's terrific. And it's just. I love your game. <laughs> it's just reading, but there's a mystery in trying to figure out who, how these characters interact with each other, and what the motivations are, and what happened, and that's all the motivation you need to sit here and just read, effectively blog posts, but diary entries back and forth. And I played that game until I got 99% completion because I wanted to know everything in this story, and that was just. So you failed. <laughs> <laughs> but that's. Pure, that was a pure literary experience done through a game, which I thought was, I'd never played a game like that before. I thought it was really impressive okay. and really interesting. I, th I think, it's, I think uh, writers and games should do whatever they want. And what's, what I think is yes. cool <laughs> is, uh, is like, I mean, traditionally it's, it, it takes a long time to be a good writer and it takes a long time to learn how to program a game. And, but in the last few years, it's become so easy to make games in different ways. There's so many, like, really good tools so people from a writing background or, or whatever different backgrounds suddenly can make different things and explore different things, mm -hmm. which is finally it's not just programmers who are deciding what games look like. Great. I mean, I, I feel like ambient storytelling is an important way to get narrative across to a player, and it's sort of something that is almost unique to gaming in terms of telling a story, and there's stuff to explore there, but I feel like we shouldn't, like you say, there's a balance. We can say, oh yeah, ambient storytelling is how we get through story and we right. don't want to tell have people talk to each other anymore. Mm -hmm. It's clearly. Mm -hmm. and, and there's something about like when something is new uh, and you're being sort of like you're exposed to something for the first time, it's really exciting. Um, like a certain method of mm -hmm. storytelling. Um, and it's easy to lose sight of the fact that it's it's just another tool in your toolbox. And I feel like as as a creator, like sometimes the some of the skills as a novelist that I developed as a novelist are like the, the plotting and that kind of thing aren't as applicable, but the characterization, the atmosphere, the, the kind of environments, um, all those things are, are totally things I can pull from that, from, from that tradition and apply to another. Yeah, it's totally, I'm, I'm all about plot. And so the nice thing about Choose Your Adventures, you can tell the characters how they feel. <laughs> you feel angry and then you're done. done. <laughs> nice. Characterization taken care of. Great. <laughs> I, I think you brought up Portal 2 as, as a, an example of ambient storytelling, and I love ambient storytelling, especially as a visual person, but I think it also has fantastic dialogue. Yeah. That's, like, world builds as much as the storytelling and feeds into so much more of your understanding of, of characterization. And the voice acting. And the voice acting is so good. I but, don't skip that voice acting. Oh, no. <laughs> nice. you know, I said um, ambient storing towards storytelling was sort of almost exclusive to games. And I said almost because I saw um, Sleep No More in New York, which is a version of Macbeth where they have this whole hotel and the play is sort of going on in real time. It's so awesome. And you're just exploring this space. <laughs> so sometimes you'll be reading documents just like in a game, going through someone's diary, and then someone walks by and you can follow them. And it's as close as I've been to playing a game in real life, and the closest, there was a, this revelation of saying, oh my God, ambient storytelling in an actual environment. <laughs> like, you can do this. You can yeah. build environments that way in the real world. Yes. But that's a theme park. It's kind of a theme park, yeah. Yeah, yeah. like I, th I feel like we've, we use that in architecture all the time. We're being told a story right now. <laughs> it's about how wonderful books are. Yes. It's true. <laughs> oh, we need like a bloody handprint on the wall. <laughs> 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 nice. It would be a twist. <laughs> okay. So, so wait a second. Can you actually get a coherent grasp of what's going on. I mean, if you actually are in a hotel yeah. and the narrative is taking place in real time, yep. it seems to me you'd have to follow the protagonist around. You, well, there's mul you can follow multiple characters around, so you can get one character story. It's kind or of how Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are in a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, but you can, you can stay in a space and see the character in that space, you can follow characters. It's, the play loops through three times, so you can pick up stuff you missed during one of your run-throughs. It was incredible. That's I, awesome. It, yeah, it was really cool. Awesome. And it had this gameplay element where you're choosing your own adventure in this, uh, in this space. But you don't interact. You're just, uh, yeah, you're watching NPCs, right. and you're learning about them. And Actors, not NPCs. The other cool thing <laughs> is that the whole, the whole audience wears masks. Everyone's given this like blank mask, and so you can't even see what the other audience members are like thinking and reacting to. Yeah. It's just the cast. Those are the only human faces you can see. Yeah. That's awesome. Great. To, just to 
keep, I love this topic. Um, the other thing about ambient storytelling is that somebody wrote that, right? Somebody wrote the story of the person in the bathtub with the wine, and like, even if it was just that piece. So it's really just writing that's cut up into these little modular elements and then planted for you to find in a nonlinear way. But it's mm -hmm. not not verbal in its source, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, it's absolutely, and you can do it verbally, and I think you do do a little bit of it verbally there. But also it's almost like solving a puzzle where you, you're like, oh, these pieces, oh, that's how they fit. That's really cool. Like it, you get that rush of I'm smart because I solved the puzzle, which yes. is nice in games. Absolutely. I feel smart. So we have time for one more awesome question. <laughs> Someone got an awesome question? Everybody? Oh, boy. Now it's hard to choose. Uh, I got to choose that guy. Yep. <laughs> Uh, the question was, can game mechanics get in the way of uh, telling a narrative? I feel very much like I don't have access to a lot of dual stick gameplay, but on the other hand, like I'm very good at the original Devil May Cry, and I don't care at all about the story. I'm in it to kill things. <laughs> <laughs> so it really depends on what you're trying to present, and sometimes I think there is some some maybe some cognitive dissonance between these like hugely narrative games that are also really, really, really hard. Mm -hmm. I think it happens often where you have this comp. I mean, uh, I think it's the remade, the remade Tomb Raider where you kill your first guy and there's this cutscene where Laura Croft is like, oh my God, I killed a human, I'm really sad. And then in the next room there's 40 guys you plow through. <laughs> and you're like, how, how can I feel about the character when that happens? And uh, I read this review of Bioshock 2 that's talking about, or no, Bioshock Infinite saying, you know, this is a really interesting story told in a context where you shoot everything that moves. <laughs> and if you're trying to talk about the value of human life, how can you reconcile that with a gameplay of I am a walking gun to kill people with? It's even in like some, the game uh, Walking Dead, like there's a weird thing in that the funniest part of that game is when you die, when your main character dies. Because you're like going through this game, it's all really sensitive. You're looking after this little girl and, and uh, you know, your friends are dying and it's really tense, but then all of a sudden, oh, a zombie jumps out and bites your neck and it's like, you died. And you're like, what? <laughs> uh, yeah. And then you start again. And then you and have the to go through. The pacing is kind it's, of it's strange. You get to start again yeah. as a zombie? Like, you come back and your, your vision is kind of blurry and black and white, and one of your eyeballs was fallen out, and you get to, like, eat the, the characters you were trying to protect before? The, uh, the Prince of Persia remake handled that well, too. Where it was, it was structured as this Prince of Persia in the future telling you the story about his life as a kid. And then when you died, you would rewind time and not die. And it builds this storyteller prince who's like, yeah, then I was running the ledge and fell and died. No, wait, I didn't. I made the jump. <laughs> <laughs> so it sort of marries the two in this weird way, but it kind of worked really well. Yeah. Well, great. I just want to uh, thank our amazing panelists. Cheers. Um, yeah. And and what's going on now with Wordplay is um, there's going to be about a half an hour break. Um, feel free to check out uh, the 20 plus games in, in the Learning Center right over there um, uh, with various different takes on writerly games. Um, feel free to uh, check out some of these books. Uh, don't steal them. And, uh, and I guess as well, consider um, uh, Christine Loves, uh, who's sitting right over there, uh, the aforementioned awesome game maker uh, with Analog A Hate Story. Um, she's going to be giving a, a Twine workshop at 3.30. So if you haven't signed up for that, there are limited spots available. Feel free to, to, um, to line up outside the Learning Center at 3.30. Um, and we'll try to fit you in. Thanks again. <laughs>